All right, thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me. I've been driving around all week with my good new friend, Pat Cahill. And Pat's been coughing a lot in the car, and I think he's decided to share all of that with me. <laughs> he did finally teach me what a good, good glass of Guinness or a pint of Guinness was, so that was kind of fun. But anyhow, I'm getting there. It's my first trip to Ireland. I've been everywhere else in the world. There's two places in the world where there's a good dairy program, and I haven't been there. This was one of them. New Zealand's the other, so I got to check one off my list. I'm a conversational speaker, so if you guys have any questions, excuse me, I'll try to get my voice under control here. Uh, please raise your hand as we go. I'm okay with that. I don't mind being interrupted. You never know where it might lead to. Um, just a little bit, a lot of questions earlier in the week about where the heck is Cornell. Um, so if you're familiar with New York City, that's down here. Ithaca's up here, that's where Cornell's at. There's a bunch of lakes in this region, lots of cows. I live up about right there. I can drive about 15, 20 minutes and touch about 30,000 cows. And those 30,000 cows will probably average somewhere between 12 and 13,000 kilos of milk a year. And the high one is just over 14. So really high performance herds, really some of the best dairy producers I know. Uh, so frustrated with the uh, US and world milk market, they built their own um, milk powder plant just last year and are operating that. Not that that's really saved them much, but that tells you how aggressive they can be. Uh, we do have our own research farm. Uh, we opened this, uh, the original, the farm that I kind of grew up with was uh, built in 1972 and was falling down. So we uh, built a new one across the road. There's about 550 lactating cows. They've been in there, sorry, that's supposed to say opened in September of 2013, not December. I typed that wrong this morning. Um, currently making about 44 kilos of milk a day. And the rolling herd average is about 13,475. So good producing herd, very comfortable herd. They're on sand beds. Uh, they lay down about 13 hours a day. Uh, it's, it's got the highest laying time, cow comfort index of any herd in the region, and that's kind of one of, our, one of the things we wanted to achieve. There's other things about the facility you wouldn't like, just like every dairy farmer. We didn't get everything we wanted because of cost, but yeah, for the most part, the cows are quite happy. <clears throat> so with that, I'll, uh, I'll start in what we're going to talk about, and I'll kind of walk between the two slides. I can't really stand in one spot and talk. Uh, a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to talk about the biology of heifers with some benchmarking. I'm going to talk about this lactrican hypothesis, the role of colostrum in feed efficiency and growth. Then we'll get to early life nutrition. And I'm going to talk about the implication of illness and what that does to long-term productivity. Uh, and then we'll summarize. The question that came before the break I thought was a good one. Why don't we just let the cow suckle the, or the calf suckle the dam? Well, that's, that's a really fun question. My students always deal with that in the classes that I teach. What have we done to the cow in the last 60 years that's really you know, beneficial to all of us? Well, we've got her to make more milk, right? We've selected for a lot of milk. While we were selecting for milk, what's the other major change, anatomical change that we made to the cow to ensure that we can get that milk out of the cow in a good amount of time? It's teat length, right? We took the teats from about this long down to about an inch. Right? We did that for milking speed, because if you've got a cow making you know, 50 kilos of milk, you can't get 50 kilos of milk out of a tube this long and do it effectively. So what happened to the ability of the calf to suckle mom? It doesn't have the same utensil anymore, right? You, when you think about what the target is, that target's very, very different. All right? So that's one of the reasons we can't leave the calf with the cow, because it just doesn't have the same size uh, teeth. Right? They can't really effectively suckle anymore because they don't have a big teat cistern. All right? And we don't really think about that, but that's one of the major reasons. The other major reason is if you ever studied Pecorino cheese production, and I, I work with some sheep producers, especially in Europe and down in, in Italy, those, they have to let the lamb suckle the, the ewes. You will find tremendous, so, and they never suckle their, their own mom, they suckle whatever they want whenever they can. Staph aureus is a huge, huge problem in those flocks. Just tremendous staph aureus everywhere because the calves are always running around suckling everybody else. And um, there's lots of other stories I could tell you. But So there's lots of reasons why we don't let the calf uh, suckle mom anymore. But the big one is an anatomical one where the teat just isn't built for that anymore. So moving on. What's the goal of the replacement program? 
So I told you something about the dairy producers that are in my area. They push and they push and they push and they push and they want new things, they want better things. They say, come on, Van Amber, you gotta figure this out. They'll say, over time, we gotta have better dry cow programs. They'll push all of us in the dairy program at Cornell. Jason Carsey is, a, is one of the co-authors on some of this because of some of the things that we do together relative to how do we characterize, they, they want us to make a heifer that can produce to its optimum. And, and we keep struggling with that, but we've got some definitions to kind of get everybody on the same page. And I'm not sure which screen I'm gonna to talk to yet, but I'll probably do both. So the primary goal of all heifer programs is to raise the highest quality heifer that can maximize profits when the animal enters the lactating herd. Okay, well, the, the hardest thing about that is what's the highest quality heifer? And that's the struggle that we have is defining what a quality heifer is. Where we're at is this idea is it doesn't carry any limitations. There's no, nothing that detracts from her ability to produce milk once it enters your herd. Now, there's all sorts of things that fall into that, right? There's all sorts of uh, criteria that have to be met. How much colostrum did she get? How fast did she grow? Did she meet all the benchmarks for growth? Has she been treated or has she not been treated? Um, what, what factors have occurred in her life that would keep her from using her genetic capacity? Because what we're learning is they're all, they're all born with the same kind of DNA. We all select for milk. We all select for basically the same thing. Yet we all know everybody's got slightly different milk production. That milk production is due to your environment and your management. There's very little genetic diversity out there in reality, right? Because we're all using the same sires, right? We're all, you know, all the studs are now using, you know, genomics. So that's really changed things. We've all got very short generation intervals. So unless you're using a bull that you raised yourself, genetically, we're all pretty much on the same page. The question is, is can we change the way the heifer uses those genetics? Can we actually tell her and when do we need to tell her that it's okay to use that genetic capacity? And that's one of the things that, that we think about, that I think about. You know, I had a geneticist friend who would tell me, you know, when down in the basement of Morrison Hall when nobody else could hear, that he was pretty convinced that most of the cows walking around out there really could make somewhere between 30 and 50,000 kilos a year. It wasn't just the world record holders, it was a lot of cows. You know, and that would lead to this big discussion about, okay, when, is it, when do we need to tell that heifer that it's okay to do that? And how do we need to tell that heifer that it's okay to do that? That's kind of how I frame my thinking, and you guys might sound that sounds a little unusual, uh, but that's really, um, that's kind of driving, that background's kind of driving how we look at this. So we want to optimize profits by obtaining the highest quality heifer at the lowest possible cost you know, low cost, low cost, low cost, that's the number one key to dairy farming, right? And usually in the least amount of time, right? How early can you calve them in? And I know you guys are on grass systems, so you're kind of tied to, you gotta get them ready when the grass is ready, and, and that's okay. In our system, we're kinda, you know, 24 seven calving, and we just wanna get the system so it works um, as early as possible. I'm gonna share with you what that really means. There's some pretty interesting data that's out there now that kind of tells us that younger is always better. And anybody who's aged a little bit will tell you, you know, you know that you worked better physically when you were younger than you do now. And I think the cows are the same way. All right, so we wanna focus on return on investment over their productive life. I think this is the hardest thing to do is that you know, as dairy producers, you know, I grew up a dairy farmer. I still work with cows, obviously, and we have our own farm. You get very chore-oriented, you get very task-oriented. Sometimes it's very hard to step back and say, hey, what's really going on with my system? All right, and that's the beauty of the role I have right now is I can step back and look at the system and say, okay, how do we optimize the system? The system starts probably at birth for us and then goes to some endpoint, whether it be culling or depth, whatever it happens to be. And everything that we're trying to do is, re is maximize the return on investment over their productive life then really trying to optimize productive life is probably one of those objectives. We want to minimize the non-completion rate. You know, I've heard a couple figures here in the last few days. You know, one of the figures I heard was 22% of the animals that were born never make it to lactation. All right, that's a pretty high number. In our system, we would be 10 to 15, and we would be struggling. We would, we would want to get below that, but 22% says there's some opportunity there. 
and that if, you're, if you have 22% non-completion, that, that cost, the cost of raising those animals that never make it to lactation, should always go into the cost of the overall system. And you'd be surprised how many people uh, will, will not be honest with themselves and never in, uh, put that into their calculations. And then you have those that, that start a lactation but never finish. You know, and our, our overall objective is to optimize the productivity of the animal. And I just kind of refer to this, manage them for the genetic potential starting at birth. All right? But it's, it's hard to understand that sometimes because we, we always want to assign a lot of what a cow does to her genetic capacity. But we all know that you know, if you looked at what that cow's making on your farm right now, 70 to 80 percent of that cow's daily activity is really about management environment. 20 to 30 percent is about genetics. All right, and that doesn't change no matter where you go. And I can tell you that if you look at a corn plant or you look at anything else, they all kind of behave the same way. We're always in that 20 to 30 percent genetics, and the rest is all management environment. So it's a lot of that, that ownership comes back to us. But some of it is environmental, and that's what I'm trying to understand is when do those environmental cues get turned on, and you're going to find out that those environmental cues get turned on very early in the life of that animal. Okay, so quality, you know, some key areas around quality, and this isn't all owned by the heifer, you know, outstanding growth, few to no treatments, you know, we want to minimize the amount of treatments for respiratory or diarrhea or anything like that, high quality environment, good airflow, low ammonia accumulation in the, in the environment, too much ammonia, then they've got a respiratory problem because you've got really bad air. Uh, minimize organic material contamination. In other words, we want to keep clean bedding there and not keep too many bugs growing around them. And meet all the growth benchmarks for optimum milk yield. All right, I was, you know, your cost of 1,500 to 1,600 euro um, is actually pretty good. We're somewhere in the 2 to 2,400 range. Our, on, on average, our range would be probably the lowest cost that I am aware of um, with some opportunity cost built in is probably 1,700. The highest cost is about 2,900. All right, so there is a big range in the in the value of raising a heifer. Feed is is a majority of that. Then we've got labor, non-completion or non-performance. We build that in at 10 percent. Then it comes down to the number raised. And and as Emer was pointing out, what do you do with your excess heifers? How do you capture the value of your excess heifers? Do you grow your herd, or do you sell them off? Do you sell the lowest 10 percent of your heifers to somebody? How do, you, how do you make use of that, uh, that decision-making process? Okay. So we, we talked, I heard some questions about calving too heavy uh, and body weight. I'm going to skip over this slide here a little bit, but we'll come back to those targets. And I think, uh, you know, we calve them too late, too light, they have to grow through that first lactation. Uh, we calve them too heavy, they calve in like a fat dry cow, and then they don't make as much milk, and you've got a problem both ways. So either way you do it. I will tell you, lighter and earlier is better than older and fatter, okay? So the risk is always better, lighter and thinner and younger than older and fatter, all right? So if you're going to do anything and err to any one side, always err to the side of too light and early than old and, and heavy, okay? But one of the things that we did a few years ago, trying to help some herds kind of just take a snapshot of what their management looked like, and that we came up with this replacement heifer management snapshot. And this was really just to help start to identify some of the things that might be going on in the herd. So the first thing we did is um, first calf heifers treated as a heifer, as a calf or a heifer. Our target was less than, equal to or less than 30%. And then we wanted to know from 24 hours of age to three months of age, what percent did you have there? versus four months to freshening. You know, because if you had a lot in this phase, then that probably, there's a lot of things, this is a more complicated phase, obviously, because now you've got the milk feeding phase, you've got colostrum, you've got the environment, uh, you've got the transition phase from milk to, to dry feed and the ruminant. Um, so there's lots of activities here that could be going on that you gotta focus on. If you've got it out here, now you gotta say, okay, what is it about my housing? What is it about uh, where I keep my heifers, what is the management around them after I get them into the ruminant phase that's really causing me problems. Most of the time, this one's easier to fix, but it's harder to identify because we don't record a lot once they get past that calf stage. And that, this forces dairy producers to do that if you really want to understand it. 
DOAs, it sounds like you guys do pretty well with DOAs. Our goal is to be less than or equal to 7%. If we can get below five, that's great. And then on, on herds, we'll look at, you know, what's the split between the males and the females? You know, a lot, of, a lot of people don't like their male calves. You get a big herd. We don't really treat our male calves all that well. But what that may tell you um, and what might be useful is to look at the split and help you understand, well, how are my management SOPs being enforced? Uh, is this contributing? Is there something related to DOAs and uh, calving ease? All right, this helps us work through a bunch of things, uh, but it also just makes us understand, are we losing a lot of calves, right? First calving average peak, so first lactation peak should be 80% of the mature cows. First calf uh, lactation total yield should be about 80% of the mature. You don't want to be any higher than 85. Uh, if you're higher than 85 here, then it says your mature cows aren't going where they're supposed to. And if you're less than this, it says that you probably didn't do a good enough job with your heifers all the way through. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. First calf calls less than 60 days in milk should be less than 5%. First calf MEs should be greater than mature. I don't like mature equivalents. Mature equivalents were uh, construction of geneticists who didn't know anything about the animal other than the birth date and the freshening date. And they made the assumption that a younger freshening animal was always going to be less mature. Um, and that's not necessarily true because it's, irrel it's not focused on any kind of growth function. So I really don't look at uh, MEs anymore. First calf treated in lactation, less than 15%. And then we're, we're focused on 85% retention to the second lactation. And this is a number that a lot of people don't look at. How many of those first lactation animals can you manage to get to the second lactation um, and, and, you know, to maintain uh, your herd age? And if you're losing more of those first lactation animals, you've got to figure out why that is and when it's occurring. And then if, of any of these things, you've got to go back and, and uh, kind of improve it. And this, you know, so if we could use this snapshot to kind of get just an idea, what is your heifer management on the farm right now, and then what do we need to do to really improve it, all right, just as a starting point. So this is probably the hardest thing. Um, I make a joke about this back in the US. Um, if your nutritionist walked on the farm and you said to your nutritionist, I need more milk and I need it cheaper, and the nutritionist said to you, great, how much you making and what's it costing? If you said, I don't know, but I need more and I need it to cost less, what do you think you're gonna accomplish? And you're all looking at me like, well, that's a stupid statement, right? But when the nutritionist shows up on your farm and you say, hey, you know what? I got to improve my heifer program and I need it to be cheaper. And he goes, great, what are you doing right now? What do you do? I don't know. I haven't measured any of them. But I know it needs to be better. That's exactly where we're at in the US right now. We got a bunch of people who say, I need a better heifer program. I need it to be cheaper. I need to have better heifers but we're not monitoring anything. So how do you know what we're really doing? How do we make it better? We, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So understanding this, and I know everybody's, you know, I've already got a little bit of time. I don't have a lot of time to do all this stuff. But at some point, if we're going to build a better heifer, we have to have some feedback. You have to know something about what they look like as they go through uh, the system. So this benchmark, you're going to see this a few times. I think you heard it already from Niall. Uh, birth to weaning, double the body weight, right? And uh, there's lots of reasons why we came up with that. Primarily, we came up with that to be proactive. Because if you went to talks, you know, 20 years ago, when I went to talks 20 years ago and I listened to people talk about high cows and fresh cows, they had all these positive, proactive goals and objectives, and then the calf person would stand up and talk about death, scours, maybe rumen development, right? Which were all kind of reactive things and not really proactive things, and we don't make good decisions when we're being reactive. All right, so this is, that's where this came from. Puberty happens somewhere between 42 and 45% of mature body weight. I think this is really the thing that we have to hold on to because we get very, we anthropomorphize. We say, well, this heifer can't be bred until she's a certain age. Um, well, she's not a human being. We tend to associate age in human beings with some of these functions when, in fact, it really comes down to when are they hitting puberty. And that, in a heifer, almost always happens someplace in here. It doesn't really matter how big the heifer is at a mature size. She's almost always going to hit that at somewhere around that percent of mature size. And then we want to get them, we want to start getting them pregnant. We want to definitely breed them, but try to get them pregnant somewhere between 55 and 60. The data out of the UK would suggest you get them pregnant by 65. 
And, and they'll say, start then. I don't like that. That's too late because you're a little bit passive about this, especially if you're not monitoring your heifers. So you want to start early, make sure you get it done early. Uh, and then they're pregnant by 65%. And then first lactation, post-calving body weight, somewhere between two, 82 and 85. The data from our research and some data out of Spain would say 81 to 82% is the threshold. Uh, our dairy NRC committee uh, used that data and said, well, they're going to be a little more conservative and say 85%. But I will tell you that if you can get past that 80, get to that 82% threshold, uh, that's what you want. And in that, 82% of mature size will allow you to achieve that 80% of mature cow milk yield. All right, and that, we've looked at that. That's true for jerseys. It's true for crossbreds. It's true for Holsteins. All right, and, and again, herd size is really, if there's anything that varies genetically, is probably herd size. And you guys have what sounds like a more uniform group of cows than some other places that I know, primarily because you're all grass-based. But I will tell you, in the state of New York, I can drive around and I can find herds with mature sizes of 800 to 850 kilos, and I can see mature sizes of somewhere between 600 and 650, okay? When you have that dichotomy, even within 50 miles, you can't make the same recommendation for a body weight at calving. You have to do it as a function of the mature size of the herd because you're doing a disservice to the really big cows or the really small cows if you just say, hey, everybody has to calve at 520 kilos post-calving body weight. Well, that's going to be too small for the 800 kilo herd, and that's going to be too big for the 600 kilo herd. Right? So we have to make an adjustment based on where what population that you're working with. And every population has its own bell-shaped curve. There's going to be some small ones and some, and some big ones in there, but the mean is what we're focused on, okay? And all those things, all these benchmarks are designed to optimize this first and subsequent lactation milk yield. Somebody had asked, how do you do this? This is the way we suggest, and Niall uh, answered this question already, but we look at uh, mature weight somewhere at the third and fourth lactation, 800 to 200 days of milk on healthy cows not your cull cows. And uh, our cull cows were really expensive in the U.S. over the last couple years, so really good cows went to, went to market, so those cows were probably representing the herd, uh, but that's the, the cull price is dropping now, so uh, some of those cull cows actually do look like cull cows now. All right, so here's what happens if you don't monitor effectively. And because of that, uh, because of that milk price in the U.S., we had a lot of herds that were culling their heifers or culling their cows quite heavily. Uh, our cull price uh, for some of those bigger cows would be $1,800, all right, because we have a beef herd that really isn't all that robust right now, so the dairy, the dairy herd was actually taking the place of the beef herd. So we had a lot of animals going to market, and you know, if you can get $1,800 for a cull cow, you're gonna cull more liberally than you normally would, which means we now have herds that are 40%, that 45% are first lactation, okay? but they, they kind of shot themselves in the foot, right? So they took the luxury of culling the cows and making all that money, and they had all these replacements behind them, um, but they didn't monitor the replacements. And now they're screaming, hey, we gotta have more milk, we gotta have more milk. Well, your milk decision was made months ago when you didn't monitor your heifers, all right? So here's, a, this is a dairy comp output from a, this is a 900 cow herd. All right, this, is, this is just plotting milk by lactation. This green line is the third lactation. The blue line is the second lactation. The red line is the first lactation. And you can see these guys are peaking about 115 pounds of milk. These guys are peaking about 100 pounds of milk. And these guys are peaking uh, just under uh, 80 pounds of milk. And you notice that the peak on the first lactation is at the fifth test. That doesn't bother me. If you got really good heifers, sometimes they have to grow into it. Peaking a little bit later than mature cows is okay with me as long as they're doing it at the right level. The problem here is that they're not. And I see a lot of herds like this around the world, you know? And this is where I think there's some real problems, and this is where we're losing some milk opportunity because what's going on is that these heifers should be peaking at 80% of these cows, right? These cows should probably be peaking a little bit more too. But these, and there's some facility issues here, but these heifers are not meeting the benchmark. And what we find is they're at 69% of the mature cows for peak and overall 69% of the mature cows. So in this system, we're 10 to 12 pounds of milk per heifer off per day of what we think the opportunity is. You got 40% heifers. What just happened to your high herd average? 
and then we got a low milk price, so what happens to your margin? All right, it's down. So this herd is hurting. But you know what? This herd's not unique. <laughs> and my guess is your herds are not unique either. Um, or some of them. Five out of five, so the dairy program that I teach at Cornell, we do, we do real-time case studies. The students will go out. We have herds. We sign confidentiality agreements. We get to see everything on the farm. We know exactly what they've got in their checkbook. We know how much money they make. We know what their income is. We know how they get rid of their cash. And then we analyze the dairy and the management and everything that goes with it. And then we make recommendations. And this is how we teach our students how to think about dairy management and integrating the biology with the economic decision making. And this is now six out of six. I didn't upgrade the slide yesterday. Six out of six case studies in the last year and a half, every herd has exactly the same problem. You know, and these are really high performance herds, right? These are herds that in good times will make $1,500 to $2,000 net farm income per cow, right? Low cost, aggressive, very high margin herds. And they've not taken the time to monitor. They're doing really good with the calves. They're not monitoring their heifers, okay? So if you guys, you know, I don't know what your population looks like. I haven't been here long enough to walk a bunch of cows, but my guess is your heifers are probably not performing quite where we want them to because I see this problem just about everywhere I go, right? But the bottom line is, is that there's a lot of milk in this opportunity right here, and they should be up around 80%, uh, and, and this is uh, having a big impact on what I see going on in the U.S. right now. As a matter of fact, uh, we do uh, discussion groups. I hear you guys do a lot of discussion groups, and those are awesome. I participate in a lot of those, you know. So the question from the group, how do we optimize first lactation milk yield and quality of the heifer as she arrives at lactation? So exactly the objective that I gave you that Jason and I have worked on for years. And so here's 12 herds. Uh, so in this, we, they, it's always fun, these guys. We got all the data from the herds. We shared everything. So this herd, first herd, this is a really high performance herd. Their heifers are doing what? 68% of the mature cows, they should be at 80, okay? That guy was a little bit upset. The next one, 85%. That makes the heifers look really good. Problem was, mature cows are overcrowded to beat the band, so they aren't performing the way they want. It makes the heifers look really good. They're really not at 85%. The heifers are underperforming. It's just the mature cows are being squeezed a little bit. A third, you know, 75, 82, Herd four is the best one, five and six, right at 80%. So these three herds are actually doing really well, but you can see opportunities in every one of those other herds, right? So we see this everywhere we go, that there's opportunity to get more milk out of that first lactation, but the problem is, is we don't have enough information on the monitoring the growth rates and meeting the benchmarks to know whether we're on target or not, um, and that, I think, is costing us a lot of milk, okay? Here are the targets very quickly, uh, this table. So you could have a small mature body weight animal, 500 kilos, and you can go up to those larger Holsteins and Brown Swiss. And you can see if you want to get them start pregnancy by 55% of mature weight, there's your target breeding weights, right? So it's not going to be the same for every farm. And you could have Holsteins that are 650 at maturity, and you could have Holsteins that are 800, and it says, you know what? You've got a pretty big span there in the weight that you need to get them pregnant, all right? Once you get them pregnant, at those weights, at that percent of mature weight, everybody has the same nine months, all right? And you'll find that the growth rate from pregnancy to calving, no matter the size of the animal, is pretty similar. That's a little bit higher for the larger mature size, but they're not really high growth rates, you know? For a lot of them, they're gonna be 700 to, 700 to 800 grams a day. You know, we're not looking at extraordinary growth rates. If you are running them over the scale, you have to be careful when you get the third trimester of pregnancy because the gravid uterus, the fetus and placenta and all of that is growing at about 650 grams a day, okay? And just about every cow. So if you run a third trimester heifer over the scale and you see that she's growing at 700 grams a day, what does that tell you? She's actually not growing. It's only the fetus that's growing. She needs to be growing twice that. Right? She needs to be growing at about 1.4 to 1.6 kilos a day over the scale because that accounts for both the fetal development and mom. And the first time that we have dairy producers actually go out and weigh animals and see that growth rate, it freaks them out. It's like, my heifers are growing too fast. No, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do because the fetus and the placenta are actually gaining a fair amount of body weight um, as it develops in that third trimester. Okay, so if you're actually gonna do it, be prepared 
you're going to see some pretty big numbers, and it might, it might bother you at first, but it's actually the way it's supposed to be. Okay? So I'm going to switch gears now. Now we're going to go back to when do things happen. So when, do you, when is the process of creating quality heifer start? What do you guys think? The moment she hits the ground? Speak up so I can hear you. She's inseminated. When she's inseminated, close, just after that. After she does what? After she conceives. Yeah, it's really fascinating stuff. So this is Katie Hines' web page, or blog page. She's an evolutionary biologist at Harvard. And I, I do, uh, in some of the work that I do, I get to in, interact with some really interesting people. We had a conference a few years ago. I've interacted with her in the past. We had a conference a few years ago all about this mom and baby relationship. And we had primates. She does work on primates, by the way, primates and humans. All right? But she actually does do some cow work. She's got this blog called Mammals Suck Milk. And we had this big uh, national conference on, uh, on the role of mom and what mom puts in the milk and how that influences the offspring. And she came. And we had people there to talk about sheep and pigs and, and all sorts of other mammals obviously calves, and we got her really excited about calves for some reason, and uh, she asked lots of good questions. One of the questions she asked me in passing, and I didn't think she was serious about this, but she said, Mike, do you have any evidence that uh, if a cow has a heifer that she makes more milk? And I looked at her and I said, no, nope, never heard that in my life. Don't know of any data. And she goes, well, I think that's true in primates and probably humans. I said, hmm. I had not really studied that. So anyhow, she went off and she found some people. Hello. There we go. Um, and that's the title of the paper. She went off and actually did a study. And uh, she found a large data set, the US data set. And the title of the paper is Holstein's Favor Heifers Not Bulls Buy Milk Production Program During Pregnancy as a Function of Fetal Sex. All right. And this is really interesting. And we don't have time to get all the nuance of it. Uh, but what's interesting here is that they were able to study on a large data set the effect of the first pregnancy sex on the first lactation and the carryover into the second lactation. They looked at the effect of fetal sex during the second pregnancy on the first lactation, right, since you could be pregnant during that first lactation and on the second lactation. And they had a large data set. They had 2.4 million cows or lactations from 1.5 million cattle. And what they found and I keep forgetting to switch this, about 450 kilograms more milk over the first two lactations, um, about 490 pounds for the first, each lactation the first two lactations. So what they found is that, in fact, if the cow knows she's carrying a heifer, she's going to make more milk. Okay? Really intriguing. Now, some people would say, geez, the bull's going to be bigger, so why don't we do that for the bull? And I said, well, the bull's probably going to figure that out on his own. He doesn't have as much work to do as a cow does. Right? His, his workload's going to be a lot different. The guys and the women all know that, okay, when it comes to reproduction. So I think this really means is that you're trying to favor mom because mom is the one that does all the nurturing, right? But the first lesson that I learned here that you guys are going to see as a theme is the heifer. Mom wants the heifer to be more anabolic, right? She wants better growth. She's going to do everything she can to enhance the productivity of the heifer. And I think that, just a second, I'll get you in. The reason for that, I think the primary reason for that, or not the reason for it, but here's some of our, our thought process, right? I keep asking, I asked you guys early on, when do we tell the heifer it's OK to use her genetic potential? How does she get the signals? When does that start? Well, obviously, it starts pretty early on, because even mom is doing what in favor of the heifer? giving her some more nutrients. So she's sending a signal that you need to be better, and we know that that positively reinforces her production capacity. So there's actually something going on here where mom and baby are communicating in ways that none of us have ever really thought about, and it's all geared towards that idea that we've got to make the heifer grow faster and be better and have more nutrients. Yeah, just going on that debt there, um, should we be leaning towards sex semen? So. <laughs> Yeah, the guys, there's a couple of guys. Edema and Ostergaard are two guys that do a lot of modeling on sex semen. And I was surprised at how fast, you know, this paper came out in, in late 2013 or mid-2013. These guys had a paper published in the Journal of Dairy Science uh, basically within a year saying that if you did that, 
You know, this is the, this is the marginal return. So $6 per lactation marginal return for average semen, $12 per lactation marginal return for sex semen. So the idea there is yes, you're gonna get a greater marginal return if you start using sex semen. So that's the implication. It's not a big marginal return, but yeah, there is something to that. Yeah, but it's, I just find it interesting that right after conception, once sex differentiation is determined, mom knows what she's carrying, and she's gonna change the way she makes milk. She's gonna make more for the heifer. The idea that we want to be anabolic for the heifer, okay? So how early, I'm gonna switch back to my other slides because I know where I'm going. Excuse me a minute. So how early should we calve? computer when you get all this stuff in there. Is that a rhetorical question or is it for yourself, that question? Well, you guys can answer it if you want, otherwise I'll do it here in a second. <laughs> no answers? Okay. I ask questions when I teach, I ask a lot of questions and sometimes the classroom gets very quiet because if the students don't give me an answer, then I just stand there and wait for them to answer and they finally figure that out, so guess what, I have a pretty interactive classroom. Um, <laughs> it's like, well, are you gonna are you gonna keep going? I said, not until you answer the question. Well, we didn't. You mean you really want us to answer the question? Yeah, I want to know that you're thinking along with me. All right, because if you're not thinking along with me, then I'm really wasting my time up here. Um, that's what. That's not to you. That's to my students. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, how early should we calve to optimize productivity? Well, this is one of the questions that I always ask when somebody asks me to come out and work in a herd. And uh, this is an older file now. Again, this is dairy comp. And this herd was actually doing really well. But we were asking questions about, OK, when do we optimize first lactation milk yield? And when do we optimize lifetime milk yield? And then once we knew that, what we wanted to do is go figure out what group of heifers actually gave us that kind of opportunity. And this is pretty interesting. There's a lot of numbers up there. But so this is the age of first calving in months, in years and months. And here's the percent of animals in each of those groups. Here's the number of animals in those groups. So again, you can see that the, the, most of the animals are focused in this uh, 21 to uh, 23 months age of first calving. So if you look at here's the age of first calving, here is their lifetime milk yield as it was pulled off. But in, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this except that you know, we can see that lifetime milk yield was optimized somewhere around 22 months age of first calving. These are the number of lactations. There's 2.9 lactations in that group, 2.7, 2.4, 3.5. These are the heifers calving down at 19 months, long lactations, long number of lifetime lactations. That's really interesting, the way that comes out. It doesn't make you think they're making much milk. But the bottom line here is you can see that every herd has a distribution. Your herd has a distribution, and it may not look like this, most likely doesn't look like this. And the only reason I'm showing you this is to make you think about what does your distribution for lifetime productivity really look like? And at what age of first calving, and I know you guys are grass-based, so this variance is gonna be a little bit different. Well, what age of first calving optimizes your lifetime productivity? Okay? And that's really what I'm driving to here, and then, you know, and we've been able to do that in a lot of these herds, and just go out and start to ask the question, what do we need to do to either make it cheaper or make it better? And that's really the question that everybody's asking. Uh, data set that we generated uh, a few years ago now, we had two and a half million first lactations. All right, so a lot of cows. We were asking the same question. Two and a half million lactations, 937 herds in the Northeast US and California. Okay, so we were looking at a big population of cows across the US. We did this on a within herd basis. And what I mean by that is, if we were gonna do this on all your herds, all your herds were your own control. So your age at first calving, your average age at first calving was set to zero, and then we looked at the distribution around your average age. Your average milk production was set to zero, and then we looked at the average milk production around your, or the distribution around your average. And in that way it kept everybody's management consistent. If you pooled the data and then did that, you pooled everybody's management, and you get a wrong answer. You get an incorrect answer. So in the way we did this, we could account for management environment and the genetic differences among farms, okay? And then what that led to was this concept of one of five age at first calving groups. So we looked at this mean, so the mean was plus or minus 21 days, and then we went out two standard deviations, minus 22 to minus 63 days, or plus 22 to plus 63, and then greater than 63 on either end. 
whether negative or positive. So we had the distribution, and that's kind of what it looked like when we, we looked at everybody's data. Right, so what that led to was this, the average age at first calving in these, this large data set was about 25.6 months, all right, and the range was 23 to, to 30 for the most part when you looked at the, the ends of the curves on the, the distribution. But the most interesting thing was this, and again, I, I don't think you guys have that big of a range in age at first calving because you're grass-based. But what this does clearly say, and what we've learned in this, is that when you calve them young, and you look at productive days, the younger animals always have more productive days. Okay? You can never catch up. The idea, and what I'm trying to work towards, is in the US, there's still the idea that the older, more mature heifer is going to be the most productive heifer. Well, that may be true for the first lactation, but it's not true for all lactations. Okay? Because they tend to leave the herd all about the same time. <laughs> All right, and that goes to the data, the cook data that Niall was talking about. It's the same kind of information. All right, so we, if you're gonna, if you're gonna calve them in, you wanna calve them young, because if you calve them older, you're never gonna make up your productive days. They just never come back together. What's even more intriguing about that then is if you look at total milk production uh, and the difference from the herd mean, and you can see the same thing. You see the range here, the 30-month heifers to the 23-month heifers, this is, um, all in pounds, we've got about 9,000 pounds by the third year. Uh, we've still got about 8,500 pounds in the fourth year, and you can see that really it isn't on the, uh, on the youngest calving heifers, they don't get anywhere close to coming together on any group until you get out to six to seven years of herd life. Okay, so this just points out again that younger animals are more profitable, have greater herd life, and that your herd life function is really. Uh, geared towards the younger animals. Younger animals can do more work. They're going to be re more reproductively efficient. Um, they're going to, you know, and we all know that, and, and that's just the way this data set turns out, but this is really what we're seeing in most of the herds that we look at. This data just came out of uh, Wisconsin. They had 69,000 heifers in this data set. Uh, they stratified by productivity. They had a 3x high milking, and the high, 3x high milking was animals, uh, herds at 12, 7, uh, enrolling herd average or greater. 3x medium were 11 to um, enrolling herd average. 2x medium, 11 to enrolling herd average. And then 2x low, about 9 to. And uh, based on reading the, the, the paper and talking to some of the authors, this group up here, this 2x medium to 3x high, mostly all free stall herds. Uh, this 2x low, mostly all tie stalls. Uh, stanchion barns, not a lot of technology adoption over the last few years. But the question that they were asking was, what about stayability? What about herd life? What about longevity? So if you looked at days in herd or exit age, total days by age at first calving or any of those stratifications, you can see that overall, as you calve them older, days in herd did what? It went up. Well, that, that kind of makes sense, right? If you're calving them older, they're going to hang around for a while. The question is, is were they really productive, right? And that's the next slide. And the next slide says, this is days milked. Days milked said, the younger animals were the ones that were most productive. You got more days of milk out of those animals than the older animals by quite a bit. And, you know, we don't even have to look at the stratification if you just wanted to be simple and say, you know what, I'm going to draw a regression curve through this, just find one line. It's basically a very tight line. Yeah, there's some noise up here, but I don't get concerned about that noise. I just look at this and say, hey, you know what, if I want a better herd life, I need to calve them lighter. So again, the question came up earlier, can you calve them in early? Can you catch them up? Can you do things to get them on the grass? And the answer is yes. You just got to be careful about when you do it. Starting earlier, prior to puberty, is always better than starting after they hit puberty, because once they hit puberty, it's really hard to get a lot of lean growth, and it's a lot easier to get a lot of fat deposition at heifer. That's why we have to be careful once we get them pregnant. And then if you look at lifetime milk yield, again, this is all in pounds. I didn't have the kilo data with me. You can see here that lifetime milk yield, you know, on the 3x high herds, obviously the trend is towards the younger calving animals. There's a little bit of a range here. We're going from about 75,000 up to about 82,000. So there is a fair difference there, even though it's just a big scale. 
you look at the low producing herds here, it really doesn't matter, right? Herd life doesn't, or lifetime productivity doesn't matter, but the cost of raising those heifers to that age does matter. So if you're going to be more profitable and you're not a high producing herd, what do you want to do? You want to calve them as soon as you can, right? Because there's really no difference between those calving at 20, 21 months and those calving at 30 months in terms of their lifetime productivity in these herds or lifetime milk yield anyhow. Okay, so younger animals are always better. They work harder, they breed back better, they, they have less problems. Okay, we actually pulled apart one of those herds. This is from the discussion group, just to look at profitability. And again, these guys share everything with us. So here's the range on one herd, their age of first calving. Their mean was 25 months, basically. The range was 20 to about 36 months. Here's the cost to get to first lactation. Here's the break-even milk production in pounds, their actual milk production. Um, and you can see what the cost of that first lactation was, the milk revenue, and where they broke even. And you can see that in our calculations, you know, not too bad from, from, from the average down, but when you want to look at those that actually got into the black, it was those animals calving at 20 months. All right, and this is a fairly high performance herd. All right, so this was a fun exercise because everybody in the discussion group did this. Everybody had similar types of behavior, right? They weren't quite, not all of them were quite as spread out in their range on age of first calving, but this is one of the problems we have in the U.S. is getting this, uh, getting this a little bit tighter. Okay, but again, younger animals tend to be more profitable simply because they don't cost you as much to get to lactation, and you actually don't see sometimes big differences. These were the best performing heifers at the average. There were also more animals in here. But the interesting thing here is if you go down to 22 months, you're at about 21.3. You go out to 30 months, 28 months, and you've got a little bit of a difference there, but you've got a lot more carrying cost. So younger, 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 all right? So summary, productive days in milk is greater for heifers with lower age of first calving. The economic analysis indicates that lower age of first calving is always more advantageous, but the real benefit in our system, and I think in yours, is that it's the replacements to maintain the herd size, right? It's that inventory cost and um, Dr. Kennedy talked about that. How many heifers do you need to carry to maintain your herd size, and what's the cost of raising all those extra heifers? And that's probably some place when the milk price is low and feed price is high that we have to be a little more aggressive about if we're going to increase the profitability of our farm. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears one more time. <laughs> so, what's my time here, boss? Okay. I'm good. Okay. Yeah, well, don't do that. Um, <laughs> please. <laughs> so make it good. All right, all right. I'll get a little more excited here. <clears throat> it's Pat sharing whatever bug that is he got here. That's what's getting to me. So questions. I always think this part's always fun to start with the questions that we've been asking ourselves for several years. So the question of practical and research importance to us has been this. Does early life nutrition and management affect lifetime productivity? All right. That was a question. I didn't actually ask that question first. You never know where your aha moment's going to come from. We had been, uh, this was uh, early, this was late 19, 19, where was it, 1998. Yeah, it's about 1998. We're starting to publish some data. Now, the question that we really asked is, what are the nutrient requirements of a calf? Because I would go to meetings and ask that question, and nobody could give me a good answer. And I says, okay, I guess we've got to fix it ourselves. Dr. Jim Drakeley at University of Illinois, we found each other over this. We knew, we knew each other, but hadn't really kind of created a collaboration. He was asking the same question, um, but where this, on the requirements, but this question came from a, a journalist who, when they saw that, you know, to do the nutrient requirements, you got to grow animals at many different growth rates. We harvest them, right? So these are slaughter balance type of studies. You got to grind them up, chemically analyze them, put them back together that way, and that's how we get the energy and the protein. Not fun studies to do, uh, but necessary if you're going to do this. So we had heifers growing, we had heifer calves growing at about one and a half kilos on the high end, all right? So the dairy industry in the U.S. was like, why would Van Amberg be growing heifer calves at one and a half kilos a day, right? Because we just didn't do that. So she had gone to ask all of my academic colleagues, why do you think he's doing this? And they didn't really give good answers because they didn't really know what we were doing. So when she came to interview me, she asked really crazy questions, kind of derogatory, you know, is this, you know why, why would you do this? And I was trying to answer it, and she couldn't quite get her mind wrapped around it, and it wasn't going very well. And I think in a fit of frustration, she asked a really good question. 
and she said, how do you know feeding a calf this way will make them a better milk cow? And I got really quiet, and I leaned back in my chair, and I stared at the ceiling for a long time, and I don't know how long, because my head was kind of spinning after that question. I said, wow, what was that? I wonder if there's really anything to that question. I turned back and I looked at her and I says, the, the question I asked back was, how do you know what we're doing right now doesn't inhibit their ability to make milk? And that made her really angry and that was the end of the interview and that was good because neither of us were ready. Um, but that's okay, but that, I immediately ran upstairs after she left and started looking for papers. And by golly, I found a bunch of papers that said, you know what, there might be something to that question. And we've been chasing it ever since. Can we program neonatal dairy calves to be better milk cows? That's one of the questions that we're still asking, and we think the answer to both of these right now is yes. Is this the permanent environmental effect described by geneticists? How many of you remember your genetics class? I see one hand, one out of a couple hundred. That's good. Every time I talk to geneticists, I always tell them, you know, I'm always asking questions about you guys, and nobody remembers taking your classes, so, you know, you guys got to do a better job. I remember hearing this term. I had no idea what it meant. Now that I've studied this calf, I have a pretty good idea what it means. Uh, and what it means is we can change how they use their genetics many times through their growth cycle, and we're just now starting to figure out what that means. And I'll share some of that with you. If so, what's responsible? How do we know? What should we be looking for? That's kind of where we're at right now. So back to those proactive calf goals. Uh, I already shared this one with you. You know, double the birth weight. And, and, you know, there's lots of reasons to do that. I'm going to move along here. Capture feed efficiency in early life achieve breeding weight at an earlier age, potentially reduce the age of first calving or increase body weight at calving, uh, increase the potential for internal herd growth, which it sounds like you guys don't have much of a problem with here, or the one that we're going to focus on today is potentially increase milk yield and herd life. The one that I started out thinking was most important was this capture the feed efficiency in early life. These calves will grow like pigs, and we've tested that. How much does a baby pig grow at about 21 days post birth, 14 to 21 days. They should grow about 10% of their birth weight. A really good pig should be growing at least 10% of their birth weight. Okay, think about your calf at 14 to 21 days and what their birth weight is. So how much should they be growing if they were growing like a pig? Almost four kilos, right? Can they get that high? What do you guys think? Yeah, we found out that by about seven to eight weeks, we never tried to do it by 21 days, but by seven to eight weeks, we were hitting about three and a half kilos. Okay, so they can do it. We didn't do that with a lot of calves. We did it just to figure out if a calf could grow like a pig. And I'm pretty sure that a calf can truly grow like a pig. We weren't trying to balance for amino acids. Pigs are balanced for amino acids. Um, we weren't doing that, but I think calves and pigs really aren't that different. Okay, I don't think everybody should go home and do that, right? That's not what I'm advocating here. But we were looking for feed efficiency, and there's, there's literature out there, our data, data published, data on farm, that says if we do this well, our feed efficiency should be 0.7 to 0.75, and maybe close to 0.78, all right, in terms of, of gain to feed, right? Once you wean them, it's really hard to get above 0.35, all right? So it pretty much falls in half once they become a ruminant. So why not capture that efficiency? They're never going to be as efficient at converting nutrients to tissue. That's really what we're after. When you do the return on investment on that calculation, it's actually quite good most of the time, all right? Depends on the price of milk and the price of your milk replacer. But for the most part, once you get above maintenance, that return on investment is pretty high because the return on investment is really your average daily gain. And then if you do it right, that'll allow you to drop your age at first calving by at least a month. Where we're focused now is not only on that, but also on this increased milk yield, okay? We've got Jersey and Holstein herds out there tripling their birth weight by about 65 days now. Those are awesome calves. And those, those people call me up and say, hey, Mike, I met your benchmark. I've actually exceeded it. What do you think? And I said, that's great. Are there any detractors from that? Is there anything that could go wrong? And as far as I know, we haven't found anything that can go wrong. And I'll share this with you later, but the faster you make a calf grow, the more milk she makes as an adult. Right? Every data set that's looked at that ever since we kind of started to publish this stuff and talk about it has found the same thing. All right? The people that are doing genomics are measuring calves and they're seeing the same thing. Because right? they're trying to tell me that genetics really rules and they're finding out that genetics are important, but the management's just as important. So, you know, that's going in the right direction there. 
What that leads to is this kind of concept of the lactrican hypothesis, and this sounds like a really big word. Everybody in here kind of knows what endocrine is. That's when we move things through the bloodstream to target organs or target systems to control, you know, whether you want to talk about insulin or you want to talk about particular hormones. Uh, these guys are reproductive physiologists, and for 30 years they were chasing the reproductive efficiency of a pig. And again, as reproductive physiologists, they were concerned with how effectively they could get a pig pregnant and then how many piglets that pig was going to have. And what they determined 30 years ago is there was something environmental that was affecting how that pig, or how that sow produced piglets. Um, and they finally figured it out. It's actually kind of interesting. And they, they coined this term, lactrican hypothesis, to describe it. All right? And their ter definition is maternal programming extended beyond the uterine environment to the ingestion of milkborne morphological factors. Milk, in this case, can include colostrum. So the idea that mom wants to continue to communicate with the calf after the calf is born, and the way she's going to do that is through milk. Okay? And what they figured out, and what was kind of fun about this, is that in neonatal pigs, what they learned is relaxin. You guys may have never heard of that term, relaxin. You guys know what it does, though. When a cow's getting ready to give birth, what do you see in the pelvic area? You see all the ligaments relax. Where does that hor what causes that is relaxin. That hormone comes from the uterus, all right? And it gets into the milk, so cows put it in their colostrum. I kind of know how much now. I have no idea what it does in a cow, but what it does in a pig is really fascinating. What it does in that first meal is it stimulates the expression of estrogen receptors in the uterus. And baby piglets are born with a juvenile uterus, and if they get more relaxin, they get more estrogen receptors, they get more estrogen binding, and they get a larger uterus. And so for the rest of their life, they can make more baby pigs, right? So litter size goes up. And it goes up in response to what? The first meal, okay? And I asked Skip, we were drinking beer after, a, this is the same thing that Katie Hind was at, we're all together just having this kind of fun discussion about how moms do things for their offspring, and we were just kind of, we're always amazed at that. I'm always amazed at that. And, and I asked Skip, I said, I don't know much about a pig. How much colostrum does the average pig get? And he said, maybe 15 mils. I said, how much do they have to get to have this response? He says, maybe 30 mils. He says, if I can, if I can ensure that every pig that got 30 mils, I can ensure that that's, if it's a female, she's always going to have more, larger litter size. Okay? So, Kind of a fun story, one of the best stories in animal science that I know of. It took them 30 years to figure it out, uh, but they've got uh, a really compelling story here now, and they've got so much data, all right, that we should all be paying attention to this. Okay. So I think you guys probably have a theme now. What does mom want for her calf? Not to be governor of California either. Yeah. So are these two people going to get this way just by pumping iron? What are they going to have to have? Well, they got to have a bunch of protein, right? Because they got to rebuild all that muscle tissue. Yeah, she's got to have steroids. There we go. Michael told me she's got to have steroids. So she wants, mom wants them to grow and be healthy, but she wants anabolism. The question is, does she do it with or without the steroids? Does mom give the calf steroids? I see a bunch of heads doing this. Uh, I'm not so sure. Okay, well, let's look. And I have the units wrong on the cortisol and the estradiol, and I forgot to change those again. <laughs> One of these days, I'll remember. So if we look at the energy content of colostrum, it's quite high compared to mature milk. We've known that. The Ig content. You know, IgGs are obviously quite a bit higher. That's the way it's supposed to be because that's what we focused on for years and years and years. If we look at the lactoferrin content, we know that there's lactoferrin in there, and, and a lot of people have made use of that for years, and people extract that and do different things with it. You know, and that's basically to knock down, that's to sequester iron and knock down some of those iron-loving bacteria like E. coli that get in the gut. Notice the insulin level. Is that a lot of insulin? That's a lot of insulin. Why would mom be putting insulin in colostrum? What was that? To get the pancreas going. I hadn't thought of that. That may be. 
Never really thought about it. I, I got another use I'll show you here in a minute. But it is quite bioactive, okay? <laughs> and I think that's what I, one of the things you guys got to, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. Mom's putting a lot of things in colostrum that are quite bioactive. That prolactin, I have no idea where that prolactin's going and what it's doing, but that is a lot of prolactin. My target organ would be the mammary gland of the calf, if it can get past the gut. Uh, I know exactly where it's going to bind and what the outcome should be. And maybe, just maybe, we've got some evidence that that was probably what was going on in a study we did and we just didn't know it. Okay, growth hormone, IGF-1. Boy, IGF-1, that's a tremendous amount of IGF-1, okay? Uh, very bioactive. For those of you that don't know what IGF-1 is, it's the primary hormone in the system produced by the liver to drive protein synthesis, okay? So when a cow sees more energy and she sees more protein, a lactating cow, she actually synthesizes more IGF-1 in the liver. The IGF-1 goes out to the rest of the tissues, and that's how you get more milk production. So IGF-1 is actually one of the primary regulators of milk production, regulators of milk production in a lactating cow, right? But it's also one of the primary regulators of protein synthesis in a lactating cow. You mentioned there, you mentioned there in uh, an earlier I think you just have to talk into it to get it to go. Uh, yeah, no, son. <laughs> no, I, well, it's, sometimes it doesn't. It, uh, you mentioned it in earlier slide about some, in a classroom, there was relax, the relaxing Relaxing. Where is that there? Is that there? I don't have it on there, but it's going to be about the same level as prolactin. All right, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's in there in quite high concentration. I just wish I knew what it was doing in a calf. One of these days, maybe I'll figure it out. This is one of those areas where people don't give you a lot of money to do research, right? Because this isn't something that's proprietary. It's something that mom's doing. So <laughs> you, you, sometimes hard to find data or money to do this kind of work. But we're getting there. So a lot of IGF-1 to drive protein synthesis, leptin, TGF-alpha, cortisol. And look what's on the bottom there. And that's just one of them. Got a lot of estradiol. So mom is actually doing what? She's putting some steroids in there. All right. What does she want for that calf? She wants it to grow. She wants it to be successful. She wants it to be anabolic, right? So right in that first meal, mom's not just giving her the IGs, which are really important. She's given the calf a whole lot other stuff to make that calf go. Okay, so obviously, you know, as, as Dr. Kennedy pointed out, colostrum provides the IGs for passive immunity, but it also contains a lot of non-nutrient factors that support things like gut maturation. IGF-1 and insulin might act through specific receptors in the gut mucosa of the neonate to stimulate cell proliferation, differentiation, and protein synthesis. The way a bunch of us are thinking about this now is colostrum is a tool to monitor to support offspring development at the beginning of extrauterine life. That's her next big way to communicate with the calf, right? She can lick it if she wants, but that's not real communication, right? She can nuzzle it. She can do all that stuff. There's probably something physical that's important but that's not really what's gonna tell the calf how to grow and how to use nutrients, right? So what I wanna share with you now is where we see some of this coming to be in terms of output. So we can go through the literature and we always focus on this failure of passive transfer, right? Calves that don't get enough IGs. And if you go through the literature and you, you see these, the studies, you can say, all right, this paper had calves that didn't get enough IGs into their system had delayed time to first calving. Well, if you're gonna delay time to first calving, what that really says is you delayed the time to pregnancy, which means it took you longer to get there. You didn't grow as fast. And that's what you see when you read this paper. If you read these two papers, what you're gonna see is decreased average daily gain for calves that had a failure of passive transfer. And you can ask, geez, they must have been sicker. There must have been something wrong with these calves. And actually, you talk to the authors. Jim Nosick's actually a neighbor of mine. Um, and I know, I know John Robson. And he would say to me, no, the calves were fine. They just didn't grow as well, okay? And in fact, John's calves went into lactation and they measured lactation and they found that those calves, that they could have a direct correlation between Ig status and milk and fat production in the first lactation. And that for every unit of serum IgG greater than 12 milligrams per mil, there was an eight kilogram increase in ME milk. Okay, and this was actually the first study to demonstrate something like that, and nobody knew what to do with it, so nobody talks about it anymore. And we're just now pulling this out since the late 80s and saying, hey, I think we know what's going on now. And it's not the IGs. We were focused on IGs, and we used that as a proxy 
what it's probably saying is all those other things in the system are important to help that calf be better. Okay, 400 calves, it's a very similar type of thing. 400, Agway was a big nutrition company in the US and I worked with them extensively to build calf programs. They had their own custom rearing programs. They had their own farms where they reared heifers for, for dairy producers. We did this study with a, a really outstanding herd and a good calf manager, 400 calves, three different devils, a milk replacer, two intake levels, followed the calves through breeding. The only thing that was important was IG status. After all that work, I'll never forget, you know, the guy that did the work, he held up the form and said, hey, you know, this is the line. Anything above this line grew fast, anything below this line didn't grow fast. And I said, well, what's the line? And he said, it's their IG status. These are all failure passive transfers. It didn't matter what milk replacer they received. You know, and when I asked him, and this is a guy that's a PhD in statistics, he was managing calves on a farm, he got tired of the academic world, um, he had lots of good data and he knew exactly what every treatment was for every calf, he knew exactly what they received for antibiotics and what they received for anything else. There were no differences in treatments, but there was also no difference in dry matter intake. Right? They weren't sicker. They just didn't grow as fast. We had no idea what to do with that data. We put it away. I've recently found it again, and I'm starting to play with it to see if I can make something of it. A similar study published uh, 10 years ago, brown Swiss calves, two or four liters of colostrum, a little over 30 calves, prepubital average daily gain. All right, So this isn't just pre-weaning average daily gain. This is prepubital average daily gain, all under the same feeding conditions, all fed the same diet. You got 200 grams a day difference growth all the way out to puberty. Okay, so it's not just a pre-weaning effect, it's not just a health effect, it's actually affecting how they grow. Right, calved them, or got them pregnant about the same age, that was a management decision. The survival through the second lactation, 75% versus 87% for two liters more colostrum, and those that survived made about 1,000 kilos more milk. So the implication here is what? Give them a little bit more colostrum, do it right at birth, and you're gonna get what from that heifer? Faster growth, more longevity, more milk, first meal. <laughs> really fantastic, right? Okay, same kind of thing. Somebody asked about colostrum replacers. Uh, this is an older study now. This was published in the Journal of Dairy Science. I'm not sure that this colostrum replacer is actually on the market anymore. It was a serum-based colostrum replacer. Uh, and this is a study that was done over the first 29 days of life. We buy colostrum replacers to replace the IGs. This colostrum replacer did exactly what you purchased it for. It replace the IG. So in this study, there was no difference in IG status. So they had calves that were fed mom's colostrum or the colostrum replacer. They had two different milk replacers with or without animal plasma. That didn't really matter. The bottom line is those calves that received mom's colostrum had a feed efficiency of 0.4, and those that got the colostrum replacer had a feed efficiency of 0.24, or almost half. All right, IG status was the same. So this is one of the best examples I can give you of IGs are important, but this is not what's driving this, this performance, right, related to colostrum. It's all the other things that are in there, okay? We conducted a similar study. That brown Swiss study was kind of fun, but they didn't have enough information in there. We wanted to know, did they increase their feed efficiency or did they increase their feed intake due to the colostrum? Um, and we'll find out it's a little bit of both. So we did four or two liters of pooled colostrum. Actually, this is four plus two, uh, about 10 hours later, or two liters of pooled colostrum with one hour birth. Um, put them on automatic feeders, either let them eat ad libitum or restricted. The restricted calves were restricted too much. Uh, we couldn't pick up the feed efficiency. Um, all in the same pens, all on a 28% protein, 20% fat milk replacer. Um, so that protein's important, and we can come back and talk about that measured everything we needed to make it work. Uh, this is the pool colostrum, very high quality colostrum. We won't spend time on this, except that we worked really hard to manage the bacteria count. We were about 106,000 colony forming units per mil, which is actually pretty good for colostrum. A lot of the colostrum that I see coming out of cows is gonna be somewhere between 150 and 250,000 CFUs per mil, right? Which isn't such a bad thing, except that if you let it sit for an hour or two while it's still warm, that's going to be, that 200,000 is going to become 400,000, and the 400,000 is going to become 800,000, and now you're giving your calf an inoculation of a bunch of bacteria that you probably don't want to do. So cooling your colostrum, as Dr. Kennedy pointed out, is going to be one of the best things we can do if you're not going to feed it right away. So when we look at the study, this is a very busy couple of slides. 
but the, the first H is the high colostrum and the second H is the high feeding rate. The L here, so we're going to look at the first and the third columns. The second, the third column is the low feeding rate or the low colostrum and the high feeding rate. This, this is the other two were the limited intakes and they really didn't change much. You can see that the Ig concentrations were very, very high and those calves fed four liters of colostrum. Still well above average. They're different, but well above average and these calves fed just the two liters. Again, the colostrum was really well managed, so uptake was pretty good. Weaning weight, about six kilos heavier for those that received uh, the, the four liters of colostrum. Growth rate, about 120 grams a day greater growth rate to weaning in those calves that got four liters of colostrum, all fed the same diet, all in the same environment. Okay, so we're starting to see that effect here, right? So where the growth rate's being changed. If you look at average daily gain from birth to 80 days, now we're headed again, same kind of thing, about 120 grams different, that's significant. What's interesting here is look at this. Look at the, uh, the linear growth of the calves fed the four liters of colostrum versus the two liters of colostrum, right? What are we seeing in hip height gain? We're actually getting taller heifers than the heifers that were fed the four liters of colostrum. So it's not just weight gain, it's actually a change in the type of gain that you're getting, which says colostrum is having what effect? It's actually part helping the calf partition nutrients to very specific types of growth, all right? Really powerful things. If you look at the, uh, I'm going to skip most of this, pretty good, about three and a half kilos more uh, milk replacer intake. Grain intakes were pretty low in this study at this point because we hadn't tried to wean them yet. Um, once we wean them, it comes up quite a bit. But if you look at the post weaning average daily gain, about 1.1 kilos a day versus 0.88 kilos a day. So the, the growth rate is starting to open up just like it did in the Brown Swiss study post weaning. All right, so again, what we did in the first hour of life is doing what? Having this big impact on how that calf grows and how it partitions nutrients and how its efficiency can be increased. 10? Okay. Good, thank you, I'll go faster. <laughs> so what is, uh, I can summarize pretty quickly. Well, this is kind of fun. So what are some of the things that are causing this to happen? Okay. Well, this is a study done out of Germany. Uh, really well controlled, seven calves were fed colostrum, seven calves were fed a milk-based formula four hours on, aver on average after birth. Um, so what they did here is that the milk-based formula was formulated to be comparable in macronutrients to the colostrum. And they did a really nice job of doing that. We see day one on the colostrum, 200 grams per kilogram for lactose, 260, 341. You see the same thing for the formula. They did it for protein and they did it for fat, so the energy is pretty much all lined up. The thing that was different is they didn't have as much, they didn't have any hormones in the formula, but they had quite a bit of IGF-1. They only show the IGF-1 in this particular uh, slide here, but 373, 192, 85. So the first four days, we have quite a bit of IGF-1 in there because we haven't reached mature milk yet. And that's one of the big lessons, I think, for all of us is that, and, and Dr. Kennedy was showing how the IGs were going down, and the IGs are going down, the hormones are going down, but they're still present, right? So mom still wants to deliver this stuff to the calf out to at least four or five days. And I think we have to remember that, and that's changing the way I make recommendations for how much colostrum those, uh, are, and how much colostrum we give calves and for how long. So if we look at the glucose concentration of the colostrum-fed calves, that's what this graph represents. So the blue bar is the colostrum, the green bar is the formula. We can see that those calves fed the glucose, or had fed the colostrum, always had higher circulating levels of glucose. Just remember they were always fed what? The same amount of nutrients, okay? And if we looked at it day four, same kind of thing. This is at time of feeding, time zero. We see higher glucose. We look at two hours post-feeding, and we see quite a rise in the glucose concentration. Okay? So how does that happen? All right, it's the same nutrients. So mom is actually trying to help that calf be more anabolic by getting more glucose into her system. Here's the graph out of the paper. That's the one I just showed you. Here's the colostrum and the glucose, and here's the formula fed. Here's the insulin. All right? 
So the insulin prior to feeding on day four was low in both of them. After feeding, the insulin went up in the formula-fed calves, but what happened to the insulin on the colostrum calves? It went really high. So just to cut to the chase, insulin is driving the glucose out of the gut and into circulation. Okay? There's insulin-sensitive glucose transporters on the gut, and it's pushing the glucose out, so the calf is seeing more glucose. But the insulin's also being absorbed and teaching the calf how to use it. Okay? And the rate that that's happening doesn't let that insulin thing shift that much. Okay? The insulin-glucose relationship. Because when insulin goes up, you'd expect glucose to go down. In this case, glucose stays the same. We've seen this in several other studies now. It just means that we're getting a lot of glucose in there, and it's faster than the disposal rate within circulation, okay? So mom is trying to make that calf anabolic with some of those hormones she's putting in the calf, and that means we probably need to rethink how long we give some of this colostrum to cows or to calves. We need to think about second milking, third milking, fourth milking colostrum as something specifically designed for the first couple days of life, okay? I'll just keep moving here in the, in, in the interest of time. So, so colostrum is really important as a setup. If you want your calf to grow faster, we've got to get more colostrum in them. We've got to do it within a few hours of life. You know, the six-hour window is still probably the best one that I know of. If you can do it earlier, great. But if you can't, you really want to try to do it within six hours. And we can come back and talk about that. So pre-weaning nutrition and productivity. Data from lots of other species tell us that there's probably a lot of things going on here. Our hypothesis in this study was that increased nutrient intake that results in greater growth rates positively impacts first lactation milk yield. Okay? So this was a study we published a couple years ago now. There's all sorts of data here. There's suckling studies, there's whole milk studies, and there's milk replacer studies. The bottom line is the calf doesn't care where she gets her nutrients from as long as she gets enough of them. All right? Milk replacer is as good as whole milk. Bucket feeding is as good as suckling, okay? It doesn't, the calf doesn't really care. What she cares is, do I get enough nutrients above maintenance to actually be able to show you this response? So if you look at all the studies that exist right now, I think there's 13 up here at this point. All of them are positive except for two. And the two that are not positive were not really positive, we think, because there was really no difference in the calf growth up to the end of the weaning period. Right? So you didn't have enough difference in calf growth or calf weight to be able to pick up the difference in first lactation. But if you look at this, you don't have to be much of a statistician uh, to recognize that for the most part, if you ask a yes or no question, if you feed a calf better, will they be, make more milk as an adult? And the answer is yes. Okay? But you've got to have a frame of reference. So in this analysis, we threw out the highest responder. The highest responder was this one here. There was not enough data in their paper for us to be able to use it in the study. So we got rid of that. Hello. We knocked out another study, and then the study of our own from Cornell had a lot of animals in it. So we put it in and took it out and put it in and took it out to make sure that there was no real weighting effect. And we left it in in the end because it, the software understood that. If we asked a yes or no question, if you feed a calf better, does it make more milk? The answer is yes. On average, the yes or no question says 435 kilograms of milk, the lower range of 205, the upper limit of 664, highly significant. So if you take the world data and just ask, do we get enough positive effect or any effect of feeding milk to a calf on long-term productivity? The answer is yes. The odds ratio of that is two. That's really good in animal science. What this says is you're two times more likely to get more milk from a, cow, from a cow if you fed her better as a calf. Okay? So that's pretty good odds. So we feel pretty comfortable that this is a real effect. Uh, we can do things like put in a continuous variable. So we put in average daily gain, and this is when it becomes a lot more interesting and more powerful. And what we came up with was for every kilogram of average daily gain prior to weaning, using the world data set, over 1,500 kilos of milk. All right, so the faster you can make them grow, what should they do as an adult? They should always make more milk. Okay? It's a lot of milk. All right? I'm going to run out of time because I wasn't speaking as fast today. But how we use that, so in a U.S. system, we'd be feeding about 570 grams of a 2020, and that is enough energy to make about 2.2 uh, kilograms of gain. 
one kilogram of a 2820 should get us to about 0.74 kilos of gain. That's a difference of about half a kilo. We would expect if we went from this system to this system, we should pick up about 800 kilos of milk in that first lactation. But it's not just the first lactation, right? And what I want to show you, I'm going to go fast through a couple of these things. We did our own internal herd data. This is on 1,200, over 1,200 animals. What we found is in our herd on average, it was 850 kilos for every kilogram of gain. But we also found what in the second lactation? The same response, OK? So it wasn't just a first lactation response. It was a second lactation response. And if you looked at the first three lactations, it was 2,200 kilos of milk. All right, so it's a significant amount of milk, All right? And I'm going to skip some of the temperature things here. So this comes back to the genetics. In this evaluation, we used the same genetic tool that, that anybody would use to do a heritability, a PTA, or something like that. So we use very robust mathematics. The geneticist that helped me do this was amazed at this. He handed me the data uh, after he analyzed it his way. And he said, Mike, he goes, this, is a, this, is a, this blows me away. After 40 years of doing genetic work, I never found anything that accounted for as much variation in productivity. And I said, what does that mean, Bob? And he said, well, what does selection for the primary trait account for? And I said, primary trait being milk. And I said, so when you select for milk, how much of this variation in first lactation milk yield can you account for? And I said, I don't know. He said, 7%. So calf growth accounts for three times as much variation as selection for milk. So this is my point about genetics versus environment, okay? That this environmental thing actually happens pretty early, and we can reinforce it basically from day one. And that's probably what we've been missing for years is because we haven't really been positively reinforcing this genetic capacity starting at day of birth, right? Because genetic selection yields about 100 kilograms, right? So it's four to eight times more with management, which is kind of what we know, right? 70, 30. One real quick thing, because somebody will always ask us, what happens if the calves get sick? We analyze this, and then I'll be done. In our herd, um, if the calves got diarrhea, they had a reduced growth rate by about 30 grams a day. If they also received, if they had diarrhea and received antibiotics, they grew about 50 grams less a day. That was significant. In our system, an SOP of antibiotics means they had a respiratory. All right, so they really didn't feel good. They were breathing hard, maybe had a fever, things like that. That's when the antibiotics came out. If we looked at first lactation milk yield, it was not significantly affected by <coughs> diarrhea. All right, so they could have diarrhea. They could scour like crazy. That didn't seem to affect this, this long-term outcome. But if they received antibiotics, they produced about 500 kilos less milk in the first lactation. All right, so, and what I think that means is not that they had a bad lung for the rest of their life. What it means is they're really sensitive to this intake phase. So when they don't feel good, what do they do? They go off feed. We all do the same thing. How long does it take them to recover? Sometimes two or three weeks. Well, in that two or three weeks, what did you do? you lost the opportunity to pick up this effect because they never came back up on feed. They never got back to the growth rate you want. All right, so I don't think it's that they're permanently damaged. I think it's that in this phase, they actually just don't eat as much and you see that being borne out here. And I saw some other data that made me believe that yesterday at an MSD meeting, okay? And then what we found is that calves, and this gets back to the meta-analysis number, Calves without a recorded treatment produce 1,400 kilos more milk. Remember, our mean was 850, because that mean included all the animals we had in our herd over that time. When we partitioned it out by those that got treated and those that didn't get treated, those that didn't get treated looked like that other mean of about 1,400, 1,500. Okay, so that's the value. Now you can see the value of keeping your calves healthy, right? And what that's worth when they get to be an adult, okay? So, I'll summarize here. The positive effect of early life growth on milk production is most likely linked to increased body protein aggregation. That's just basically saying it's growth. At least for the first six weeks, I am coming more to the conclusion that it probably has to be seven weeks. Probably something, it's an extension of things that are going on where they're still being developed as a calf. 
And anything that reduces their feed intake reduces this effect and reduces the opportunity for enhanced milk yield. So anything that we do that decreases growth actually causes us to lose profitability. We just don't realize that we lost the profitability. It's an unrealized loss. Okay? And with that, I'll stop. <laughs>